here at UNAFCO and over at UCAR, so she got a nice blended experience. So, ready? Again, my name is Rachel Medina, and I'm a returning intern, and last year I also worked with uh, John and Glenn Mattioli, so this year is a continuation of my research. Um, my research was looking at GPS data for um, the Soufre Hills volcano of Montserrat. Um, before I begin, though, let's uh, get everyone familiar with the area. So this is a um, plate tectonic, a tectonic map of um, the Caribbean area, which Montserrat is in the black box. It's a very small uh, volcanic island in the Lesser Antilles, which is um, an ocean island arc formed by the subduction of the North American plate beneath the Caribbean plate. Um, Montserrat has been active since 1995, and since it has become active, um, it has been a great opportunity for monitoring not only for um, hazard mitigation, but for understanding um, volcanic processes um, in this area, as in, like ground deformation and um, associated um, atmospheric events. So. Um, my mentor, Dr. Glenn Mattioli, has been a huge part in um, the last de decade of putting um, a network on the island and monitoring it. So the eruption that my data focuses on happened in 2003 um, in the uh, July. It was uh, the largest eruption there um, with a dome collapse leading to a forever changed landscape. Um, so this eruption, as I said, was um, an extremely large eruption that happened for two days, and the dome collapse happened um, in the middle of the night between um, the 12th and 13th. So last year, my focus was on um, the GPS data that had been processed after this eruption, uh, looking at a specific um, GPS station firm located closest to the um, volcano dome collapse. And last year, uh, we looked at the vertical data for HERM, and there was this huge ver uh, anomaly that was consistent with the timing of the dome collapse. And this um, anomaly is um, shows the station dropping two meters and then rebounding within an hour, which is um, really uncommon. So last year, I um, looked at two hypotheses, whether this um, huge drop um, was attributed to ash clouds during the dome collapse or whether it was actual ground deformation um, surrounding the station. Um, but since, so I looked at GOES images to try and constrain where the ash cloud was, but the methods I used were incon um, inconclusive. So this year we focused on um, reprocessing the data. Maybe there were um, some parameters that were showing a, that we're going into the position data, making it um, not as precise. So we use um, Gypsy Oasis, which is a program put out by um, JPL, and they have um, basically default parameters, because um, when they use the program, it's usually looking at a small, um, amount, a small increment of time where the atmosphere is not changing, so the atmospheric um, variation is very constrained. But in this region, uh, in the Caribbean, it's very tropical. This is um, Hurricane Hugo that happened in 1989. Um, so the atmospheric vents are, um, can affect the precision of GPS data quite a bit. So this summer, we spent um, reprocessing the data, changing, uh, finding th changing three variables and finding which was the best for um, giving us more accurate GPS positioning and um, parameter we changed, we looked at was um, the random walk of uh, the zenith delay of the wet wet troposphere. Um, the next one was the horizontal gradient uh, for the atmosphere, and then the random walk for position. Um, so to find the best variables for um, our particular data, we looked at uh, BGGY or Boggy. This is a GPS station located on Antigua, which is 48 kilometers away from Montserrat. So, so these islands are fairly close together, so they experience the same atmospheric events, but this island is unaffected by um, volcanic processes. So we use Boggy as 
a control for um, modeling the atmosphere correctly, for so then getting more precise GPS data. So um, again, the first parameter was um, the zenith, the random walk of the zenith delay, and it's kind of hard to see this graph, but um, light, the cyan color line is not constrained enough, so it's allowing the atmosphere to vary way too much for um, is. And then the blue and red line are too constrained, so we found that um, the black line is representative of this area. And I did a Fourier transform on a log-log scale, which um, solidified that. But it was an ugly graph, so I didn't put it in. <laughs> um, the next one was the horizontal gradient. Um, just the gist of this, we found that um, the smallest three parameters were good, so we went with one of them. Um, and then the last one was the random walk position. Since Boggy is uh, not on an active um, island, it's really not going to move in its x, y, z coordinates. So the uh, random walk for positioning, the most constrained was the best because um, for this. So after getting the three, finding the three, um, variables that were the best parameters for this, then we reprocessed the data and looked at Herm's vertical position again. So looking at the graph, this is the one from last year with the old processing and the default parameters, and this is the new one. So essentially all of the um, vertical movement has been taken out, which is more realistic. Um, so zooming into the, so these are on the same scale here with time, the 48 hours the, of uh, July 12th and 13th, um, and then this is centimeters. Um, so they're on the same scale, but then zooming into HERM by a factor of 10, you can see that it's still following the same path, move, path movement, but the variation is only um, two centimeters versus two meters, which is more realistic. So then now, so which is exciting. <laughs> um, so now looking at the uh, troposphere data for this, um, now this is uh, 20 to negative 20 centimeters. So, um, oh, I forgot to mention, but during the eruption, there were also thunderstorms. So uh, an atmospheric event going on while the eruption is happening. Um, so this uh, spike in the uh, wet delay of the troposphere kind of um, could be indicated as like um, signals of the storm. And then right here we see um, a spike of eight centimeters in the wet delay, which is perfect timing with the dome collapse. And during the dome collapse, there was a surge of more ash clouds. So this could potentially be a signal for the ash clouds. So now we have the bigger radiation really happening in the troposphere versus the ground. Um, so then looking at the rest of the stations, um, focusing on SOUF, which is in the southern part of the island, MVO, and then Boggy on Antigua, they all have um, this general increase during um, the middle of the two days, which could be the storm or ash clouds. Then Boggy also has a general spike here. So they've, they're all experiencing roughly the same um, atmospheric events. And then looking at the vertical data for each station, so Boggy is not really moving, and then we have um, Herm still dropping, but moving and ending at um, a higher, like two and a half centimeters um, higher elevation than at, before the eruption. So this could be from uh, the unloading of such large material from the dome collapse. Um, and then we have Sioux um, moving as well, but down. So MVO one this shows a bigger spike than Herm. So this could have been like an air, like human air of me. Um, or processing, so we'll kind of leave that one out. But so this shows like what is actually um, a, a better um, better for um, for interpreting of uh, the volcanic processes and deformation during the eruption. So to conclude, um, these re, uh, reprocessing uh, showed us that last year's parameters were uh, very optimal at all for this type of area. So um, now that, so they needed to be adjusted. And so we found the random walk 
um, of the troposphere, the horizontal gradient, and the random walk of the position um, that are best suited for this area to have better um, interpretation. Um, and then this could hopefully be used for further work in this area um, to understand the volcanic processes. Um, I'd really like to thank um, Dr. Glenn Mattioli and Dr. John Brown for teaching me so much this summer and making me realize what I really like about volcanology. <laughs> um, and for Recess and UNAPCO giving me this opportunity again, and for everyone that's helped me through the summer and listened to me practice. And um, Thank you. Any questions? Nice job, Rachel. Thank you for that. Um, I was wondering, the Gypsy code, is that run through MATLAB? Um, it's run through, I guess, Linux. Okay. How difficult was it to get into the code to be able to change these parameters? Um, well, most of the code writing Glenn did, and then uh, we, as a group, decided which, um, basically, variables, like an array of variables, to try for each one, um, and then just, and then I, typed in Linux the command to run the code and, and then gathered all the data, graphed it, and looked at it. Cool. So. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lots of things to go through. Now that you've got the uh, processing and the parameters mostly figured out, do you think you'll be able to do further work and uh, get some idea of the azimuth and distribution of the ash clouds or whatever was causing the, the atmospheric conditions um, that was causing your, the problems with your data? Yes, definitely. And this is from 2003, so um, and there's been eruptions since, so I think that this can help um, future modeling and understanding what's going on. So do you think that maybe, yeah, like when you say future modeling, you think you might be able to look and say, well, we've got ash clouds here versus this in this direction or that direction? Yeah, because the spike was only at Herm, that extra spike. So maybe the ash cloud was only interfering with the signals going to Herm. Yeah. Um, Can you look at like the relative? Can you break it down individually into the individual satellites, maybe? Yeah, probably. If I, um, I would have to look into, yeah, like the geometry of like yeah, where so the satellites the are and their site, basically. signal path. Um, but in this area, the um, winds are, I, I guess, easterly, so they blow um, coming from the west, east to the west. So is that westerly? Easterly. Easterly. Okay. <laughs> And Herm was closest to the dome, so. But it did, it survived. <laughs> just just for clarification, we we weren't really interested in the atmosphere. Part, part, <laughs> pardon, John, but we were we were interested in understanding if we could optimize the estimate of the ground deformation, because that was what. Uh, there was a very large apparent signal which turned out to be dominated by atmospheric interference. Perhaps we can move forward. All right. Thanks for listening. <laughs>